Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. My name is One of One, but you can call me Seven. And we're really on our Witch on the Holy Night tear recently. I've just been, I don't know, I've been engrossed in the story. I've been ready to see what comes next because I feel like we're about to hit something big. Oh no, that's just, that's just what I'm predicting because I, the way I feel the story going. Still lots of like exposition and lots of explaining going on, lots of description. That's just the way the visual novel is written. And I feel like it's a slow burn, much like my experience with Steins Gate, if any of you guys watched that. So now we're ready to start chapter eight. We have to see, last time we did the whole like Martha sub chapter. Um, and now we have to see how this relationship is going to continue to play out and what else might get thrown into the mix. Maybe new characters, perhaps new mages. We'll have to see. So let's get moving. So yeah, chapter eight is called, are you for real? Exclamation point, question mark. There you go. Let's see what they have in store for us. Misaki High School's winter vacation began in mid-December. The tranquil air of the school was a refreshing change of pace from the more competitive schools and their nationally famous sports teams and exam-oriented curriculum. The empty, newly constructed building evoked images of a pure white swan descending upon a still winter lake. The modern school building felt alive in its stillness, in spite of the absence of its lifeblood of students. Most students never knew what this building used to look like. It was just a small, run-down wooden building, a shadow of its former self. The former school was never torn down and now stood in lonely silence. It was tucked away deep in a seemingly infinite wood that stretched across the mountains. The sound of brooms sweeping dead leaves resonated in the air. The ocean of leaves had accumulated into piles as big as sound sand dunes. Sweeping was a futile venture at this point. An ominous feeling lingered in the air, perhaps the result of two years of abandonment. Cleaning the inside of the building alone would take more than a few days to finish, not to mention... <sighs> Is this uh, Kinomi? Students, damn it, not machines. We barely get any winter break and then the student council, council has us out here doing this crap? My man. The misguided youth sent here for the job wasted no time making it clear he wanted no part in the beautification efforts. You could judge the At least let us wear a jacket or something. It's freezing out here. Is this part of gym class or something? Winter marathon training? And I'm saying this is someone who never skips gym class. <laughs> Hosuke Kinomi continued to mumble and grumble to himself as he reluctantly swept away at the ground. I like their, um... I like their, uh, like their little tracksuit uniform. Pretty cool. Meanwhile, Sojiro silently and swiftly continued his sweeping, glaring at Kinomi out of the corner of his eye. You seriously try to clean up all this for real? There's only like 40 of us out here. There's no way we're going to get all this cleaned up, so who cares? Anything can be completed with diligence, Kinomi. Stop complaining so hard. There you go. Yeah. Angie, Angie, cold mountain time. There is no hint of sun in the cloudy sky above. Midwinter light pierced through. A day like this was best spent indoors under warm blankets, but for some reason they were out here cleaning. A special winter cleaning team. That was the name given to this elite force sent to clean up this dilapidated, overgrown mountain. The other students had put their faith into this team to fulfill this beautification mission, respecting them for their sacrifice. Oh, right! They were talking about this earlier on in the game. In one of the earlier chapters, the student council, um, Tobimaru and, and, and uh, Alko were talking about needing to get people to volunteer for this, but eventually they were just going to have to force people, and it seems, force people they did. Um, ragtag rag dare losing gang of students needing remedial lessons before their exams. They were the victims of a year long arm twisting scheme by the student council. Which again is just two members, right? Just president and vice president? Yeah, blizzard looming over the horizon. None of them had any semblance of interest in the task at hand. <laughs> Roasting sweet potatoes. What is this, the 50s or something? Looks like they don't even know how to roast them properly. Oh, I know. Want to grill some squid? Kinomi did not want to be here to begin with and was constantly trying to break Sojiro into joining him. The cleaning squad was divided into groups. Sojiro and Kinomi were in charge of cleaning behind the gymnasium. Sojiro was the leader, Kinomi was a grunt. Look at them go! Beautification efforts, let's go! We're in it to win it! Um, eat your sweet potato or squid or whatever it is you want because it'll be lunchtime. Look at him go! This guy's the goat. Always ready to do the work. Put in the effort, you know? Seven o'clock, oh god. Sojiro alone had worked in complete silence at the same blistering pace since he started. The sheer amount of work he put in was likely the only thing keeping him from complaining of the cold in his thin jersey. They should let them wear coats, Jesus Christ. Ice, ice skating rink? It's just a pond. Frozen solid, dude, that's how cold it is out here. A normal human can't work in these snowy conditions unless there's some kind of robot. We're about to have to start eating each other to survive if this keeps up. 
Why won't you just take a break for a minute? We get all these leaves together, why don't we burn them and get warmed up? Nobody's really watching. Come on, let's grill some squid, please! He's just droning on and on about his squid. So he's reaching his limit. Kinomi, please. There he is! The big man himself. The big man on campus. The Grim Reaper. In his hands, he held a rake instead of a soft bamboo broom. Sounds good to me. I'll let a bit of grilled squid slide. Far be it from me to get between the big man and his squid. I tell you what, I'll even get you the soy sauce. You know, we shot to attention of the voice behind him. Ah, Tsukiji, is that you? Before quickly turning around and swinging his broom in the process, Tobum, Tobimaru easily blocked the swing with his rake. Oh, so now you want to use that broom, huh? Just can't contain all that hard-working spirit I see. Maybe I should assign you to the special Siberian trail then. Stand by the furnace with the girls pretending like you're on a Caribbean holiday instead of out here in the freezing cold. And now they're gonna fight. They're gonna... They're clashing, actually, with their weapons. These two were only friendly with each other on school grounds. Please don't distract him. Put away their weapons. The only one cleaving with a garbage bag in hand. Something you can help with, Tobimaru. Pretending to tend the fire over at the furnace. A harsh comment. Apparently even Sojiro had a slight taste for drama. So it's come to this. Even the outstanding students like you are looking down on me now. <laughs> but as long as Tobimaru continued to claim he was helping the girls clean by doing nothing more than standing in front of a pile of burning leaves, Sojiro found it hard to sympathize. Busy doing work here unlike some people. Almost break time, let's go get warmed up. Not for you, idiot. Only people who've actually done some work today can take a break. If you want to come stand by the furnace, then bring me enough leagues to fill a cart. Until then, keep sweeping. Nice, 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 nice. Yeah, he's leading, so you can't really fight back against him. He knew he'd be on cleaning duty tomorrow and the next day, too. Here we go, people. Don't ask me why, but we have a bunch of cans of sweet red bean soup. Some meat buns would have been better, but that would have required a certain someone to use their brain. We've also got some emergency chocolate. God damn it. What the hell was she thinking? Sojo reassured Tobimaru by saying that he thought the food would do just fine for everyone. If you're not coming. We can just burn some leaves to stay warm, like Kinomi said. We've got a pond right there, so we can easily put it out when we're done. Okay. So we got a... Is that, is that a glimmer of friendship I just saw? You know what? They're as pure as the snow is white. This is nuts, but just wait here, Shizuki. I'm gonna go grab some potatoes from Akabane. What a guy. What a fella. What a friend. Hot can from his jersey pocket. Mmm. Yum, 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 yum. Go chill over here, too. I guess we both know how to deal with people, huh? All right. Time to start a fire. So they're doing lots of- it's still lots of slice of life stuff. We haven't been back to the magic side of things in a minute now. Um, remember the good times from his past? Tobimon felt a touch of concern as he looked at Sojiro. He saw within him homesickness and retrospection. He also saw a dark shadow looming over him, like a stranger in a foreign land without a home. Damn little time. Aww, what a fella! If you need to talk, I'm here for you. Just let me know. Continued speaking with a pull tab from the can of sweet red bean soup still around his index finger. Taking a break from school, Aozaki slugged me. She said, I've got a big mouth. Wow, congrats. Sometimes Sojiro would reply incoherently like this. Tobimaru chalked it up to cultural differences? How are things going with Aozaki anyway? I used to walk with her to the train station before exams. Have things been going well since then? It was obvious to everyone that that was far from the case. Yet he asked anyway. Live together now... Jesus Christ. Oh, so oh, I see. I see. That was quick. Dating already, huh? Nobody might have tried to laugh off Sojiro's all too casual confession. However. <laughs> nice, 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 nice. Did, did, did a spark hit you? My friend just said the wildest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh my god. You're not joking, are you? One day you're barely interested in girls, and the next you're shacked up with one? Tobimaru had always felt that he and Sojiro were an equal match strength-wise, but for some reason... You cannot shake the feeling that Sojiro was now his superior in the brain department. Sojiro cast a rare angry glare in Tobimaru's direction. That was awfully rude. What do you mean I'm not interested in girls? Sojiro seemed genuinely angry and his voice was icy. This uncharacteristic level of anger from Sojiro was enough to get Tobimaru to back down. Hey look, I was out of line. I just assumed a few things, I apologize. But seriously, what do you mean you're living with her? This all seems way too fast for you. 
Yeah, just a room in her house. It's an attic, man. Come on. It's not like that, like that. That mansion? The Kornji mansion? What kind of wizard shit are you able to pull, huh? Come on, dude. You're talking to the heir to the Tsukiji throne here. Of course I know about the mansion where the first daughter of the Kornji group lives. She's a sophomore at the Ryan Girls Academy, right? Kornji, what? Tobimaru reluctantly explained everything as simply as he could so Sojiro could understand. The Kuonji group, well, they're, they're more like a foundation, really. All you need to know is the whole family is loaded and they own and manage various companies together. They're not quite a conglomerate, but they're a big deal in the exports industry. They used to operate out of England because their old chairman loved the place, but things went south about five years ago, so they moved all their operations back here. Since their son took over, things have rebounded for them. And that's why you see their name plastered around town. They contributed, like, half of the funds required to rebuild our school. Damn! Jesus Christ! Filthy, I mean, yeah, that's, that's fuck you money right there. Everything seems to be owned by the coin. It's a, it's a, um, what's it called, um, it's a Kirijo situation from Persona 3 Reload, or Persona 3 in general. Why so, why is she so frugal all the time? He mumbled incoherently to himself. Tobimaru looked at him with a complex expression on his face, somewhere between envy and heartfelt sympathy. You've done good for yourself, buddy. Tell me the truth, though. When a guy and a girl are living under the same roof, only one thing can be happening, am I right? That's a surprisingly old-fashioned thought for you to have, Toby. I'm surprised that you even know what he's referencing here. Oh, give me a break. What kind of guy is afraid to talk about this kind of stuff? I suppose you're right. So the truth is, I've watched her sleep. Though Sojidon and Alka were living together, there was absolutely no chemistry between them. I... I wouldn't say there's absolutely zero. But it's not great. No, the situation is not good. Though that was not to say that living in such close quarters as they did, unintended mishaps did not occur from time to time. But even still. You'd be surprised how nothing like that goes on. The mansion is pretty huge, after all. Everyone was often busy in their own affairs, so there was no opportunity for that sort of thing to happen. Uh, I mean, answer me this. Would you suddenly make advances on Aozaki just because you were living under the same roof? Nope. Never. Tobimaru nodded intently as if he was thinking back over his many ex-relationships. Well, this all sounds very wholesome. Yeah, I feel great. Sojiro gave no more than a quick affirmation to Tobimaru's despondent murmur. He was doing fine, but besides his physical health, it was surely Sojiro's personality that enabled him to maintain any semblance of peace dealing with both Aoko and Alice while living in that mansion. Totally indebted to her anyway. I'm not sure how I can ever repay her for what she's done for me. Sojiro's eyes turned slightly serious as he stared into the fire. Tobimaru felt that there was more to those words than what Sojiro was letting on. You owe her. And just then, a strange scream pierced through the still silence of the wood like a knife. Did you hear that? Yeah, and it was Kinomi. Sojiro had already stood up before he responded. He bolted to the frozen pond, broke the ice with his broom, scooped up some of the frigid water in a bucket, and threw it on the fire all in less than 10 seconds. Then he immediately ran off into the depths of the woods from where he heard the scream. Tobimaru followed after him in panicked confusion. Uh-oh. Do you know what's down this way? The remains of the old school building should be there. Anything else? You know, like a pack of wild dogs or bad stuff like that? Huh? No, dude. If anything, it'd just be some deer or rabbits or something. Then there's nothing to be afraid of. Let's hurry. Perhaps because of his time spent growing up in the mountains, Sojiro quickly sprinted over the slippery dead leaves. Tobimaru was not particularly cautious himself, but nevertheless, he could not keep up with Sojiro in here. Before long, he found himself running alone. When foliage blocked the natural trail, he would sometimes clear it away by brute force. But just as often, he would expertly weave through the brush. It was clear that he was used to dealing with this level of nature. Oh, where are we now? A clearing, the wall of trees, man-made, old wooden school building. Aesthetically pleasing building no larger than an elementary school lost in the depths of the winter Kinomi. wilderness. Stood alone on the old school's grounds. What are you doing here, Shizuki? A sour expression came over Sojiro's face as Kinomi tilted his head in confusion. That's what I want to know. What was that scream all about? Huh? What scream? I was just pissed at this dumb kid. Look, there he is. I know he's got some potatoes on him. Damn it, we let him run off inside. Alright, so somebody entering the school building. This is where kids hang out nowadays? So this is a child that you- you chased a child that you don't know? You just thought he might have food? Okay. Not particularly dangerous. Paved road too. He only followed it to get here. A child, and he squinted. Blonde hair, which kind of freaked me out at first. 
foreign child in a provincial town such as Misaki. The soldier had never even seen a foreigner. Why did you want to run? Akabane said they stole, this kid stole their food. A little menacing, Kinomi. Yeah, he's just a kid. Exactly. Come on, let's head back. That kid is over there just staring at us. And besides, if Tobimaru sees us up here slacking off, we're going to be cleaning this mountain for the whole of winter break. Sojiro took Kinomi by the shoulders and began leading him back to the path he came from. Okay. Okay. <laughs> How are you so fast? Tobimaru could hardly catch his breath. He arrived about three minutes. Three whole minutes. Damn. Damn, that's kind of crazy. Are you alright? What about you, your highness? First ever display of concern for him. Perplexed. You're out here in the middle of nowhere screaming bloody murder, and what am I supposed to think? We were worried. That was my fault, I guess. I, I guess I jumped to conclusions, rather. You probably never heard him do it, but sometimes at work, Kinomi has this habit of letting out a weird yell like that. Kinomi looked disapproving as Sojiro nonchalantly shared this insight. This was the first he had ever heard of it. You're up to something. Of course not. Come on, there's cleaning to be done. Alright. You didn't set the old school building on fire or something, did you? They tilted their heads in confusion as they reluctantly followed the unusually aggressive Sojuro back to their cleaning spot. Interesting. And so, the special winter cleaning team's activities ended uneventfully. A blonde child. We have to store that in the mine bank for now. Three in the afternoon, come hang, two hours until the shift began, so he's just gonna fill it with something. Sojo thought about relaxing in a park somewhere, but quickly changed his mind after remembering how cold it was. Oh yeah, pills in the morning. So yeah, he shouldn't head back. So he should just go hang with the, with the fellas, right? Oh. Man, lame, I wanted to see more of the dudes. I love those guys. Those guys are sick. Alright, so we're back in the mansion. Ever since final exams had ended, Aoko and Alice had switched from their daily routine to a more irregular schedule. Aoko would disappear into Alice's room in the West Wing, probably for training, right? For a while, and Alice would go to Aoko's room, not to be seen again. Oh. The so soldier's not allowed- well, of course he's not allowed to know. Yeah, he's not interested. <laughs> Aoko and Alice did not seem to want to include him either, serving both parties nicely. Rondi state's pretty peaceful. Tadaima! Says I'm home. Made it, to ha made it a habit to greet them? Cute! Well, this looks cordial enough, maybe? A large, extravagant, uh, extravagantly decorated mirror. Alka was dressed for comfort, wearing jeans instead of her usual skirt. In stark contrast, Alice was dressed in her usual all black. The witch still insisted on wearing black. Sure. As Alka had explained, it was probably because it was too much effort for Alice to wear anything else. Sojuro's thought was that he would like to see her wear something different. A casual drip Alice would go super hard. Dispute, huh? Both ignored his greeting. Alice only briefly looked up at him. Tokawa points. Won't be so easy to remove. Oh, they're starting to say words I don't know. Language I don't understand. The Tokawa one is still active, but the Suzu who support next to it has gone, so we can't really be too careful. With each sigil they discover, they get better at finding the others. That makes sense. I guess once, uh, once they found one, they can easily find the other connections. I really messed up. I should have been more careful. This is going to turn into a weekly battle soon. Oh, look at him standing there. Dripped out. My man. Okay, so they're going... Concentrate on the discussion at hand, so strange. Setting aside the timing of the puppet that night and how quickly they were able to find our expertly hidden sigil. Whoever it is most definitely has to have some kind of hideout in the city. But if that's the case, why aren't we detecting any abnormalities in the field? The dragnet around Misaki City hasn't been broken for nearly a hundred years. Alka bit her nails nervously while Alice nodded along. It seemed as though she was wondering the same thing. Even my mother wasn't able to touch this bounded field. The only person capable of getting through Misaki's bounded field would have been your grandfather, or an even more capable mage. But someone exuding that level of magical energy would find it that much harder to cover his or her tracks. It could be some kind of unique concealment ward, but... I haven't heard anything about any new fairy circles forming these past few years. Where was it? Sherwood Forest? The Making was able to break through your mist, remember? Do you think there's some kind of concealment stronger than that? 
All I'm saying is, if whoever we're dealing with has skills greater than our own, maybe there are some techniques we aren't aware of. Either way, we need to reevaluate things. We might be under more pressure than we thought. Okay. <laughs> Sanjiro, speak, King. Speak your truth. So, I'm home. Alko finally looked up at him in response to his hesitant declaration. Oh, come on! He's just trying to say hi. Jesus Christ. Give him a second. Five minutes even. Will you please take a bath? You're dirty. And with that, Alka returned her gaze to the mirror. Alice briefly looked up at Sojiro again before also returning her gaze to the mirror. And he's got... He's just... He just disappears. He dissolves. Perhaps feeling at least somewhat satisfied that his greeting was acknowledged, Sojiro left the drawing room and closed... Man, I just want one of these girls to, like, shake his hand or something. Show him some form of accept acceptance or, or, or affection. Friendliness, even. God... All right, well. Time for you to take a bath, big man. Get in there. Sojo had left, but the two girls were still locked in their heated discussion. Needless to say, the topic of the conversation was still that of the outsider mage who had appeared in Misaki City last month. This was, after all, the problem that had occupied their time before this whole situation with Sojo arose. Dealing with and eliminating the interloper who had set his or her sights on their territory. Preoccupied by a decoy, no doubt also a part of their plan. Crapped in and stolen another one. The fight against this mage has only just begun. More dire by the day. Until only a couple of days ago, the enemy had limited themselves to small skirmishes. But now they had shifted to a full-on offensive. Alko had two major bounded fields she used for defense. One, the larger of the two, was placed around Misaki City to detect magical energy and magecraft. This was used to observe and monitor visitors from outside the city and was initially set up by Aozaki's ancestors, the administrators of this territory, and had no way to be removed. The other was set up to energize and manage ley lines from within the territory. The five sigils carved into the earth made up a standard square type array, protecting all that lay within its bounds. After some manipulation of the mana flow, the power within was directed to accumulate at the Kuanji estate. That is to say, the bounded field existed to monopolize the magical energy within Misaki City. There were five sigils in total, with the Kuanji estate located in the center. If all five sigils were forcibly removed, Alko's jurisdiction over this territory would be entitled only. Without the power of the land to back them up, they would be forced to fight back against their invaders on equal ground with only their innate abilities to protect them. And that sounds like it might be very bad. The only reason Alice and the inexperienced Alka were able to defend this territory so far was because of these two fields. The dragnet that notified Aozaki of any threats was also her lifeline, but this time... Their enemy had somehow slipped through the cracks and was running rampant. This was what the girls had to face up to. Yeah, it is just a matter of time. This will be the last line of defense. It's only a matter of time before the sigils are destroyed. Our best chance would be to find their hideout. It's not exactly a necessity. They can remove the sigils for all I care. As long as you're here, then the mansion itself shouldn't be a problem to defend. And if they do, then they're marching to their own demise. What else is there to worry about? Nothing, I suppose. With only a single opponent to deal with, we're better off focusing the field of the mirror on the estate and making this mansion our last line of defense. Alice touched the mirror on the table with her pale fingers, and it rippled like water. The mirror was another protector of Misaki City, separate from Aozaki's bounded fields. More accurately, it was a ploy that existed only to protect Alice Kuanji rather than Misaki City itself. It generated a thick fog and acted as an invitation to any visitors, drawing them into its board game-like world. Alice referred to it only as the mirror, but it was known to her friends as the mirror of slumber. This was a magecraft that Alice Kuanji wielded. Within the rippling surface of the mirror, an image of a castle began to form, and also a lush forest, a field, and a river. Alko stared at the mirror in silence before suddenly jumping to her feet off the sofa. So we just get back to actually doing stuff? I mean, you need to be taking the time to make yourself less inexperienced, because holy... I mean, it sounds like you guys are... are kind of in trouble. You need as much experience as possible to make sure that you're really up to snuff in case you have to help Alice because you can't just rely on Alice. I mean, maybe, maybe that's just my mentality, but it feels like it's too, um... I'm not really sure how to put it. Yeah, I'm not really sure. It just, it doesn't make me feel good. Okay. The mirror began to consume the table in a thick fog with a single caress from Alice. If we're visiting each sigil, we definitely won't be back until morning. Ah, we'll be home in no time! Is this a proper way to do a fire pentagram banishment? Alko traced a shape in the air with her fingers. 
Starship. It's about time you learn something other than how to break things out, go. They both took their coats from their hangers and left the drawing room, so out they go. Well, excuse me. I guess I need to study some more on top of all the studying I already do. Remember that charm I pulled off just the other day? What charm? That simple mesmerize. You know, the one you taught me. Light and frail, nimble and quick. Tick tock, tick tock. There's no time to waste that one. Are you being serious right now? Yes, I'm serious. You can ask Sojiro later if you don't believe me. Alice swallowed her words, clearly displeased. She likely stopped herself in time to realize it was not worth the effort to take issue with it. What will he do while we're away? He'll be fine. As long as he doesn't try to go into the West Wing or anything like that, there shouldn't be any immediate threat to his... Alko responded hastily as she opened the door to the foyer. As soon as she did, just as quickly as Alice's doubts had gotten stuck in her throat, Alko suddenly froze, unable to speak. Oh, 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 oh! <laughs> I thought there was danger afoot. No, the only da oh. <laughs> They got me pretty good. Oh my god, first off, damn! Yeah, my boy's ripped! Holy, my guy's got it like that. For a moment, Alka wasn't sure who was standing beside or before her. She could only stare at the glinting rays of sunlight creeping into the room as she reeled from the shock. Her mind was completely... Oh, it's just a shirtless boy. Come on. But we know what it's like. We know the vibes. It was as if she had just woken up from a nap. Or Jack in the Box had just opened in her face. Sojiro was probably the only person who truly knew how long that dumbfounded silence went on. What the hell are you doing standing there like that? Aku had finally found her voice. Jesus. Oh, what are the scars, man? What are those scars? What? I'm changing clothes, Sojiro's, res Sojiro's response was matter-of-fact. He offered no explanation as to why he was changing in the foyer and not the bathroom. Aoko was too shocked to read him the riot act. Sojiro was putting on a shirt, putting a shirt on after presumably just getting out from the bath. His neck was wrapped in bandages and he was completely shirtless. His hair was wet, but his skin wasn't glistening from the st steam of hot water. He must have washed himself with nothing more than cold water. Though shocked as to why anyone would do such a thing in this cold weather, she let it slide. The source of her silent stupor was simply his body. Until now, she'd only seen him as harmless. Without his clothing to hide him, however, he was more fit than she'd ever imagined. For a rough mountain upbringing where one's body and strength meant survival, perhaps he was even a bit underdeveloped. And on top of that, are those scars? Alko asked cautiously. Sojiro followed her gaze. He had something that looked like a burn scar on his arm. It was random in appearance, nothing like Alko's magic crest with its ordered patterns. Oh, this? Long time ago, I was attacked by a pack of wild dogs, and they bit me. It's a miracle I'm even still alive, so if anything, I'm fond of the scar. A long time ago. He must be talking about when he was a child. Though his life was saved, it was apparent that he hadn't been able to receive proper treatment deep in the mountains where he lived. Those scars were proof of that. Considering it had happened so many years ago, it was likely they would never fade. If only for an instant, Alko thought the wild scars left on his skin suited his lean body perfectly. Hmm. Okay, Alko. If you say so. No, no, no. She digs the scars, man. You're all set. It's okay. Scars are cool. No, it's not pleasant to look at. I should have just changed in my own room. Sojiro sounded slightly ashamed as he put on his shirt, looking at Alko standing there in cold silence. The two girls had no response. I mean, I don't even know how Alice is going to respond. Jesus. Choto a minute. Hmm? Turned around. Oh! Oh! How do I say this? Alko looked away awkwardly, apparently not knowing why she had stopped him herself. Huh? This isn't like you, Ozaki. You're acting strange. Did you get a fever or something? I bet neither of you have gotten enough sleep since all that, have you? Of course, referring to final exams, the amount of work Alko put in for exams seems strange. I, I don't have a fever. That's not what this is about. I, I just want to know why, you're, why the hell you're changing clothes here. Alko was doing her best to keep up appearances, but for some reason, Sojiro was hesitant to say too much more. So, well, um, this, this isn't easy to say, but... Huh? Huh? You, you need to take care of your underwear better. I don't know whose it is, though. Alice, who had been completely silent behind Alko, couldn't resist responding to that statement. Although she hadn't wanted to get involved, this was something she couldn't ignore. 
I must point out, it was most definitely Aoko. Alice's response was quick and to the point. I may have been in charge of laundry, but Aoko seemed like she was just holding back on going critical. Anyway, I really have to get dressed or I'm going to be late for work. Sensing that these two were probably about to get into an argument, Sojo took his chance to leave. <laughs> Alice, I'll go clean up. Alice calmly walked into the bathroom. A few minutes later, just as the two were about to head out and fulfill their duties as mages, Alko remembered something she wanted to ask. Do you think those scars were... I don't think so. He seems so proud, after all. Alko agreed. What had impressed her the most about the scars was how he treated them simply as part of his past, absent of any regrets. Alko wouldn't have gone so far as to say he was proud, but it seems her instincts had been correct. That and one more thing. One thing is clear, though. <laughs> Come on now, guys! <laughs> I wasn't the only one who was pleasantly surprised at what I saw, was I, Alice? Aoko smiled wryly at Alice, like a child who knew they were doing something they shouldn't with their friend. Look at her, that's the first time I think I've seen that face on Alice. Alice was trying to ignore her as best she could. She looked away without saying a word. Aoko let out a satisfied snicker and began walking towards the front door. Let's get going. We should probably start at that park, right? Since that's where this all started. The local park in Misaki, the place where they had run into the enemy puppets, and of course where their involvement with Sojudo had all begun. <laughs> Fun little hijinks. So they're off to check the sigils now, it seems, uh, because everything is kind of, um, I mean, this is scary. Someone's encroaching on their territory, and I have no idea of power scaling, so I really have no idea, neither do they, how bad this could possibly be. But I guess we'll find out soon enough. So that's all the time that I have for today. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I definitely did. And I will see you guys in the next video. So for now, have a good rest of your day and I will see you soon. Bye.